you today. You know, obviously this is a really important subject. So I'm gonna be reviewing both our MEF Plus and IMAS protocols. It's important that I have absolutely no disclosures and no conflicts of interest. However, it's important to realize that there are no FDA approved drugs for COVID. So most of the pharmaceuticals discussed in this talk are either FDA approved or generally regarded as safe medications that are being used off label for the treatment of COVID-19. So um, an outline or summary of my talk, I'm gonna review the stages of COVID-19. I'm gonna highlight the immune dysfunction and thrombophilia as major pathogenetic mechanisms. I'm gonna discuss the approaches to therapy in each stage. And then finally, to review the prophylaxis and prevention of COVID-19. Now, obviously this is a really big subject. So I'm going to you know, give an overview of the MAF and iMask protocols. The iMask protocol is based on ivermectin, the MAF plus on methylpred. However, there's really a lot of information. So I would suggest if people are interested, they can go to our website, the FLCC Alliance at flcc.net and we'll be able to download a whole host of useful information. To state that we're facing a global catastrophe is perhaps an understatement. We've just passed 400,000 deaths in the US, approximately 250,000 cases a day, which exceeds that of many countries throughout this whole pandemic. So we are really facing a very dark winter. And with the emergence of these mutant strains, things do look exceedingly bleak. So to just to go through the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the main mechanism is droplet spread. However, aerosol spread uh, is also uh, plays a role. As we know, uh, the virus is then inhaled into the nasopharynx. It binds to ACE, ACE receptors on ciliated epithelium enters the cell through the ACE2 receptor. Uh, it replicates to high concentrations in the nasopharynx and then is aspirated into the lung. What's important to recognize is the difference between SARS, MERS, and SARS-1. So SARS-CoV-2 in blue, you can see it reaches a higher, highest concentration prior to the onset of symptoms. Um, and so that's most infectious, so it reached the highest concentration in patients are most infectious prior to the onset of symptoms. And this contrast with MERS and SARS-1, uh, making this a particularly infectious disease. So what's important to note, and many people do not recognize this, is that there's a gradient of infectivity and ACE2 expression from the nose, the bronchi, and type two alveolar cells. So indeed, alveolar cells express less um, ACE2 receptors than does the nasal epithelium. And what I'll also show you is that, in fact, ACE2 is not, the highest concentration is not the lung, but indeed it's um, visceral fat tissue which has the highest concentration of ACE2 receptors. The importance of this will become clear. So in order to treat this disease, it's absolutely essential to recognize the phases of COVID. And this has not been well discussed or well uh, popularized. So the patients go through a number of phases. There's the incubation period, which lasts up to about five days. Uh, as we know, about 20 to 30% of patients remain asymptomatic and don't develop the symptomatic phase. Patients then move into the symptomatic phase. Again, viral replication is greatest prior to the onset of symptoms. However, as patients progress through the symptomatic phase, viral replication tailors off. Patients then move into the early and late pulmonary phase where you have no longer viral replication. So this is not a viral cytopathic effect, but it's due to the host response to viral debris. This is immune dysregulation with abnormalities of innate and adaptive immunity. 
Um, at below, one can see the clinical symptoms, the symptomatic phase, fever, malaise, cough, diarrhea, confusion in elderly people as they move into the pulmonary phase, shortness of breath, and then progressive hypoxemia. Again, this is an important slide, basically looks, looks at the phases again of this disease. You see, this is the phase of active viral replication. Patients remain infectious uh, only during this period. However, what's notable is that the PCR remains positive for a much longer period of time after viruses stop replicating. So the presence of a positive PCR does not mean infectivity. You can see this is the period of PCR positivity. Then as the virus disappears, one gets the, the presence of both IgG and IgM antibodies, which really start together, which is somewhat unique. And the disappearance of the of viral replication is occurs at the same time as one gets uh, adaptive immunity. So we see PCR positive for, an, for a period of up to three weeks, even though the patient may no longer be infectious. So this is a really important concept. Many, slide, many studies have shown this. So this looks at the, the uh, viral load and the presence of culturable replicated virus. So this is shown in the dark circle. So that you can see patients have replicated virus have a high viral load, but this disappears after the 10th day. So after the 10th day, patients do not have active replicating virus although you can see the PCR remains positive for up to 70 days. Again, this is shown in this study. This looks at cycle threshold, which is the inverse of the concentration. Again, you can see a, a culturable virus only until the 10th day. However, patients remain positive for a long period. This is a really important concept. In terms of the phases, again, this looks at symptoms with day one being the onset of symptoms. So generally people have fever for about 12 days, they have cough for about 19 days. But you can see there is this transition period where patient, patients become symptomatic, but do not have pulmonary signs and often can get better and then get worse. So the onset of shortness of breath and pulmonary signs is usually at about day seven to eight. Two or three days later, they get, get admitted to the ICU, get onto mechanical ventilation. The lower hatched bars represent patients who die. So what we do know is that patients with SARS-CoV-2 have a really imbalanced host response. So on the right is what happens with common respiratory viruses such as influenza, you get a balanced response with a host production of interference stimulated genes. You get a, a number of chemokines and cytokines. This very differs remarkably with SARS-CoV-2 in which you get a limited host immune response antiviral state with decreased production of interference stimulated genes, but a massive outpouring of inflammatory mediators. So again, just reviewing the pathophysiology. So this is not a cytopathic effect of the virus. It's really important. It's not the virus that's killing the host, but the host response to the dead viral debris. So we have the cytokine storm with inflammatory mediators, macrophage activation. We have an endotheliitis with inflammation of the endothelium. We have activation of clotting and vascular leak. So this really underlines the pathophysiology of SARS-CoV-2. And it's kind of extraordinary that it's not the virus, but the dead virus. And we knew this following SARS-1, and this was a study showing extraordinary GU-rich single-strand RNA from SARS coronavirus contributes to the excessive innate immune response it's these, these single-stranded RNA fragments, which really have a powerful immunostimulatory activity and really play an important role in the cytokine storm and the immune dysregulation. 
So this study nicely demonstrates that there are a whole host of cytokines that are upregulated. The induction of cytokines and the degree of lung injury is related to the viral load. Here, the inverse of the cycle, uh, cycle, uh, cycle threshold. Now, Obviously, the more virus you replicate, the more dead virus you're going to have. So the higher viral load translates into more viral debris. So we have this enormous cytokine response. However, at the same time, we have profound impairment of cell-mediated immunity, both CD3 T cells, um, CD19 B cells, natural killer cells, CD4 C CD3, CD4 plus cells, as well as CD8 cells. So there's profound dysfunction of both innate and adaptive immune response. So this is a really good study from Mount Sinai. Sinai. They correlated both the clinical and pathological features. So the title is Pathophysiology of SARS-CoV-2 targeting of endothelium cells renders a complex disease with a thrombotic microangiopathy and inherent aberrant immune response, endothelial damage and imbalance of both innate and adaptive immune responses, aberrant macrophage activation, which plays a central role in the pathogenesis of this disease. Again, this is a paper New England Journal highlighting the vascular endotheliitis with a microvascular thrombosis. What's really important to recognize is SARS-CoV-2 causes an organizing pneumonia. This is not ARDS. And treating these patients as if they have ARDS is a major problem. So in the next slide is a CT scan of a patient with SARS-CoV-2. This is nothing like what ARDS looks like. There's no other disease that causes a CT quite like this. This is SARS-CoV-2. And we now suggest that all patients have a CT on admission because it allows stratification of patients and one can then prognosticate and base treatment based on the degree of CT abnormality. So in terms of management of COVID-19, this is an important table. So this is based on randomized controlled trials looking at treatment which has succeeded and those which have failed. So those that are, have shown benefit in randomized controlled trials are in green, those that are harmful are in red, those that are of no or marginal benefit in brown or, or, or yellow. And we've divided this into pre-exposure, post-exposure, the symptomatic phase and the pulmonary phase. So go th going through the major drugs which have been tested, hydroxychloroquine really remains of unclear benefit in the early phase. Remdesivir, basically in the early pulmonary phase, as we'll see, reduced time to recovery, possibly no mortality benefit. Lopinavir, retinavir of no benefit. Interferons may be of benefit inhaled early, it's harmful late. Tocilizumab, really of unclear benefit, despite the recent study, and it appears it may only be of benefit in patients who are inappropriately treated with corticosteroids. Convalescent serum, as we'll see, have absolutely no benefit. And really, it's a mistaken concept that um, antibodies would work against a disease which is not blood-borne and uh, it defies understanding of mucosal immunity. In terms of monoclonal antibodies, the same really applies. We know that the Lilly and um, uh, study, as well as the other uh, study, was, was terminated early because of, uh, sorry, the Regeneron was terminated early because of harm, increased risk of death, in the hospitalized patients. It's also worth noting that the US government at the time that the uh, uh, studies were halted, spent three billion, that's with a B, dollars to uh, stockpile uh, vials of the, this medication, which was shown to be harmful. 
that $3 billion could have bought enough ivermectin to prophylax the entire country. Um, obviously, when a drug doesn't work, you try to find another indication. They try using this drug in the symptomatic phase. Its benefit is unclear. In terms of corticosteroids, as we'll go through, we know it's beneficial in the pulmonary phase. It tends to harm in the symptomatic phase. Looking at ivermectin, as we'll see, this is a truly astonishing drug. It was designed for COVID-19. It's been shown to be a benefit in randomized controlled trials, in pre and post exposure prophylaxis in the symptomatic phase and in the pulmonary phase. So this table really should inform us on how to treat COVID-19. So again, this is the adapted table with the different phases looking at the, um, in the uh, treatment modalities. Obviously, when the virus is replicating, you use antiviral therapy. It's obviously pointless giving antiviral therapy once the virus is dead. Once something is dead, it's dead. You can't kill something that's already dead. And trying to kill something that's dead is a futile exercise. Yet people persist in giving antiviral therapy in this phase which is characterized by anti-inflammatory therapy. So this is methylprednisolone, enoxaparin, aspirin, ivermectin, and this combination of flavonoids, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, and melatonin, which we'll touch on briefly. So this is in contradistinction to the NIH guidelines. So this is the updated guidelines from the NIH. For non-hospitalized or mild COVID, they do not recommend anything. For hospitalized but not require oxygen, they have no recommendation. If you're in hospital and require rec uh, oxygen, they recommend remdesivir and dexamethasone. And if you're hospitalized and have high oxygen requirements, you require dexamethasone. This is a continuation of the most uh, updated guidelines, hydroxychloroquine against, lopinavir written against, ivermectin, They've changed the guidelines, but they still say there's insufficient data to recommend either for or against, which is astonishing. Anti IL-6 antibodies again, tyrosine and John S. kinase against. Convalescent plasma, insufficient data, although in fact, as I'll show you, there's absolutely no data to recommend for. Vitamin C and D, they say insufficient data to recommend either for or against, which is quite astonishing. This was a interview with Dr. Fauci. He comments, there are two vitamins Fauci does recommend to help you, your immune system stay healthy. So I would not mind recommending, and I do it myself, taking vitamin D supplementation from the words of mouth of Dr. Fauci. In addition, he goes on, in addition, vitamin D, Sorry, in addition to vitamin D, he said vitamin C is a good antioxidant. So if people want to take a gram or two at the most, that would be fine, he said. This is a recent study showing that vitamin D deficiency increases the risk of hospitalization and death. A meta-analysis which came out about five hours ago basically showed that vitamin D supplementation reduces the risk of death and severe disease. This is such a simple intervention. It really has no political science and it's astonishing that people do not recommend vitamin D uh, supplementation. So how did we develop our math protocol? Well, um, septic shock, you know, we had our head protocol and the immune dysregulation of septic shock is really quite similar to the immune dysregulation of COVID. So we adapted our head protocol to COVID-19 and hence we developed the MAP plus protocol. What is the MAP protocol? Well, the most important component is intravenous methylprednisolone, of which we'll talk about, high dose intravenous ascorbic acid, thiamine and heparin. In addition, we add the plus plus part, ivermectin, statin, zinc, vitamin D, promotidine and melatonin. More recently, in patients who are critically ill and responding really poorly, we recommend really high mega-dose vitamin C. 
So the rationale behind the MATH plus protocol, the three core pathological processes leading to multi-organ failure and death, as we described the cytokine storm, the hyperinflammation, the increased coagulability and severe hypoxemia. The beginning of the pandemic, the treatment was uh, you know, just supportive care, absurdly. And unless you control the hyperinflammation, patients will develop progressive lung injury and will die. So corticosteroids form the backbone of MAP+. These are potent anti-inflammatory drugs. They act by multiple pathways on multiple cells. So this is a really important study. It's the future of medicine, which uh, allows us to do futuristic drug exploration. Uh, what Dr. Duhichis did in the study, they took pulmonary alveolar cells, exposed them to SARS-CoV-2, they then looked at what genes which were up and down regulated, and clearly these were inflammatory genes, using then a database of um, pharmaceutical agents. They looked at which agents would modify those gene expressions in a positive way. And the drug which had the highest hit was methylprednisolone, followed by gold and prednisolone. Dexamethasone and hydrocortisone were far lower on the list. So again, this is a biological and genomic reason why methylprednisolone is the drug of choice for SARS-CoV-2. So then we go on to the recovery study. We know this was dexamethasone um, in the recovery study. Note that they used a very low dose of dexamethasone equivalent to 30 milligrams of methylcred. This was a fixed dose regardless of severity of illness. It was for 10 days. The median treatment was seven days. And this was a, it was a really pivotal study because it did show that corticosteroids reduce death. But clearly they used the wrong steroid in the wrong dose. They showed reduction of 35% if you're on a mechanical ventilator and 20% um, with just oxygen. Uh, in those patients, again, you see who were not receiving oxygen, there was a trend towards harm. So this is really important and underlies our recommendations of using you know, immunosuppressive or anti-inflammatory drugs only during the inflammatory phase. So this is a study. So most subsequent studies they actually use methylprednisolone rather than dexamethasone. And if you look at the number needed to treat to save one life, significantly better with methylprednisolone than with dexamethasone or hydrocortisone. Pulmonologists are really familiar with methylprednisolone. It's the drug of choice for organizing pneumonia. So this is an important study, which again emphasizes what I'm talking about in terms of dosing correctly with corticosteroids. So this is the Spanish ICU network. They used a methylprednisolone. This is a large study of 882 patients looking at the Kaplan survival curves. So pre-ICU patients, so if you got steroids before you actually got to the ICU, you had the best survival. Within the first 48 hours, it was better than no steroids or late steroids. So this is really important. So it emphasizes that timing is absolutely critical when it comes to corticosteroids. And again, this is early corticosteroids versus delayed or never corticosteroids. There was a study in Brazil in which they used corticosteroids late on the 13th day or the third day after intubation with no benefit. So it's critical that corticosteroids be started early once the patient starts with the pulmonary phase. In addition, they looked at the dose response. They found that early high dose was significantly better than early low dose and no corticosteroids. So the bottom line is we want to use high dose, high trade to effect, and use early. After 48 hours, it's really of no benefit. This study, in it, so what they did in this study is looked at length of stay, ventilator three days, and obviously 
delayed steroids were of no benefit, significantly increased the risk of infectious complications. So the bottom line is you want to use methylprednisolone, you want to use it early, and you want to dose titrate to an effect. So this is an interesting study comparing the immunological profile of corticosteroids versus tocilizumab and IPIL6. You can see steroids both up and down regulate cytokines in a really positive way, whereas the effect of tocilizumab was rather erratic and rather unimpressive. So this is tocilizumab with all the randomized control studies, including the most recent recap study. You can see overall the benefit is somewhat marginal. And in the recap study, the positive effect was probably because they used inadequate doses of corticosteroids. There are a whole bunch of studies using high dose vitamin C. We talk about really high dose, uh, including this study by Dr. Bolomo, who was the first author or the PI on the failed vitamin study using high dose vitamin C. In terms of anticoagulation, the third component, it's somewhat controversial. Um, however, it appears that anticoagulation improves the outcome. This is a study from New York looking at full anticoagulation. The current approach appears to probably be intermediate anticoagulation together with aspirin. Our protocol risk stratifies patients by their D-dimer. And uh, if you use anti-inflammatory as well as vitamin C, you do not see bleeding complications. It's important to recognize that low molecular weight heparin has a whole host of other actions independent of coagulation. So it, if it interferes with viral entry, it it, 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 it activates heparinase, it inhibits heparinase, which breaks down the glycocalyx. It interferes with chemokines and cytokines, interferes with leukocyte trafficking, and actually inhibits uh, your neutrophil extracellular traps. So low molecular weight heparin has a whole host of mechanisms independent of its effect on coagulation. So we then need to move on to other therapies. This is the ACT1 trial remdesivir. Um, so what they showed a median recovery trial of 11 days as opposed to 15 days, there was no mortality benefit. Based on this study, it seems that remdesivir is the most widely used drug for COVID. It continues to be used in the ICU where it is completely ineffective. When we look at the ACT1 study, you can see that the only signal of benefit were patients who were receiving low concentrations of oxygen. Once they required high flow, non-invasive or mechanical ventilation, remdesivir had no benefit. What is truly shocking about the study is in order to get a positive outcome, they changed the primary endpoint during the conduct of the study so that this would be a positive study. Uh, scientifically, that's a considered a no-no. We then have the WHO solidarity study, which absolutely showed no benefit from remdesivir. So based on that, although it's still recommended as one of the two medications by the NIH, we can see the WHO now recommends against the use of remdesivir. So you can see the enormous chaos uh, that uh, is existing. In terms of convalescent plasma, there have been a whole host of studies that are all negative. This is a highly flawed concept. This is not a blood-borne disease, and it's a mystery as to how the antibodies, which are large proteins, get into the nasopharynx. It defies understanding of mucosal immunity, what you may or may not know is three days ago, the recovery group stopped the, the arm of the study using convalescent blessing plasma, as it was shown to be of no benefit to hospitalized patients. So we now know convalescent plasma is of absolute no benefit. In fact, in the last 40 years, 
This is the only study that has shown a benefit from convalescent plasma. And these were patients treated for Argentinian hemorrhagic fever. This is a bloodborne disease, the only disease. So the, the continued use of convalescent plasma is a mystery. Why the NIH still do not recommend for or against is a mystery. This just doesn't work. So we you know we initially, uh, our focus was in the treatment in the ICU and the development of the MET plus, but we recognized that really what our, what our duty and uh, obligation is to control this pandemic is to prevent the disease and to treat the disease early. So hence we have pre-exposure, post-exposure and early treatment. And if we want to at all control this pandemic, we need to, we need to consider prophylaxis and early treatment. Once the patients reach the ICU, we know that they're in big trouble. So this is, the, this is the comments that we get every single day. We get hundreds of similar emails. My doctor told me there was absolutely nothing she could prescribe for me once I was diagnosed with COVID. And that if my lips turned blue or I could not breathe to go to an ER. It's truly astonishing that this is the state of play currently in our country. We have no way of preventing, well, sorry, we do not in, have any accepted, recognized uh, protocol for the prevention and treatment of early COVID. This is truly astonishing. And this is again from the NIH, which refuses to make any recommendations for the prevention or post-exposure prophylaxis of patients with COVID. Hence, we developed the eye mask protocol. This is for the prophylaxis and early treatment of COVID-19. And indeed, we discovered today it's being adopted by a whole host of VA hospitals throughout the country. So in terms of prophylaxis, we have ivermectin, which forms the core. So we have prophylaxis for high-risk individuals. These are, high these are healthcare workers. These are people in... Uh, long-term care facilities, these are people with comorbidities. This is not a competition between ivermectin and vaccination. They complement each other, and therefore we also have post-exposure prophylaxis. In addition, vitamin D, C, quercetin or flavonoids, zinc and melatonin. All of these agents or pharmaceuticals have shown active, proven activity in SARS-CoV-2. Our early outpatient protocol, which is critical. We need to treat patients early to prevent them progressing to severe pulmonary phase. And it's astonishing that this type of approach is not being more widely established in our country and across the world. So we recommend ivermectin for two days, up to five days, and then vitamin D, vitamin C, quercetin zinc, and melatonin as well as aspirin as an antithrombotic agent. So melatonin may seem bizarre to a lot of people. What you may not know is that bats harbor a whole host of coronaviruses, yet they do not become symptomatic. And probably the most likely explanation is bats have the highest plasma concentration of melatonin than any species that's known. And it appears that the melatonin protects these animals. The benefit of melatonin in both prevention and death has now been well established. A study out of New York showed that patients taking melatonin had a significantly reduced risk of dying from COVID. The hazard ratio was 0.1. So I think there's you know, enormous amount, there's good physiological data and clinical data to support melatonin as well as the other pharmaceutical agents we recommend in our protocol. We then need to move to ivermectin. So William Campbell and Satoshi Omura were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015 for their 1975 discovery of ivermectin. 
It was first used in humans in 1987. In vertebrates, it binds to the glutamate gated chloride channel. It then paralyzes the worm or the parasite. It's a very highly lipophilic drug. It's rapidly absorbed, has a plasma half-life about 16 to 28 hours. What's important to recognize is that ivermectin is on the World Health Organization's list of essential medications. Over the last three decades, approximately 3.7 billion doses have been distributed. That's a B. 3.7 billion doses of ivermectin have been distributed. It's a drug with broad spectrum antiparasitic and remarkably antiviral activity. In addition, it has potent anti-inflammatory and immune modulating effects. It seems to be a drug designed specifically for COVID-19. Now, despite what's on the FDA website, which is completely distortion of the facts, it's a complete, it is a safe and well tolerated up to 10 times the recommended dose. The FDA warns about hepatitis. As far as we know, there's one single case of hepatitis reported in the entire world literature and the association with ivermectin is somewhat limited. It's also cautioned that it causes seizures. In fact, ivermectin has been shown to be useful in the treatment of patients with seizures disorder, decreasing their risk of seizures. Most of the side effects are related to the death of the parasite rather than the drug itself. Indeed, it seems placebo has more side effects than ivermectin. So this is an interesting study which looks at the tissue distribution of ivermectin. And as you'll see, this drug was designed for SARS-CoV-2. So you can see the concentration in the lung significantly higher than the plasma, but what's most remarkable is in the visceral fat. And this becomes important because as I said, that, that the lung has a reasonably high concentration of ACE2, but visceral fat is that tissue which has the highest concentration of SARS-CoV-2. As we know, obese people have an exceedingly high risk of dying from COVID and it's likely because of the increased fat mass and replication in uh, adipose tissue. Ivermectin targets those organs that are most involved with SARS-CoV-2. So what about its activity against the virus? This was the first study by Kelly and Wagstaff from Australia showing the drug had remarkable antiviral effects. They also demonstrated its mechanism, one of its mechanism of actions. What it does is there's this nuclear pore which allows uh, proteins to get into the nucleus. And it does this by shuttling through important proteins. This is how viral proteins get into the nucleus. What ivermectin does is it binds to these important proteins, preventing SARS-CoV-2 proteins getting to the nucleus. But what it also does is prevents NF-kappa B getting into the nucleus and hence its antiviral effects. Now this was their original study in monkey vera cells, which showed a reasonably high IC50. However, this is completely clinically irrelevant because we're treating patients, not monkey kidney cells. Monkey kidney cells do not make interferon, do not mount an immune response. In addition, as we said, concentration is much higher in the lung than in the serum. So Dr. Wagstaff has repeated the study based on the enormous misunderstanding. And indeed the IC50 for alveolar cells is much less, 0.5 micromolar, which is about 105 micrograms per, gr per gram of tissue, which far is far less than the achievable le uh, levels that are achievable in the lung with a regular 200 microgram dose. So this, this ongoing criticism and the negation of the benefit of ivermectin based on this IC50 is completely erroneous. In addition to binding to the important, ivermectin binds to the spike protein. Uh, as we said, it's a 
profound anti-inflammatory agent demonstrated in this LPS model. It decreases nuclear transcription of NF uh, kappa B. So recently, um, Dr. Hill was uh, contracted by the WHO to look at the results of ivermectin. Um, to date, there were 18 randomized trials. So those people in ivory towers who demand randomized trials, there are 18 randomized controlled trials to date, um, looking at day one dosing. And you can see these studies compared ivermectin plus standard of care versus standard of care. That's the way you do a randomized trial. There were nine studies that looked at multiple day dosing up to five days. Again, comparing ivermectin to standard of care versus standard of care. In terms of mortality, there was a significant reduction in mortality in these studies. 2.3 versus 10%. This is the, the uh, forest plot. You can see the enormous reduction in mortality, the risk ratio. Even assuming the worst confidence interval, it reduces the risk of dying by 40%. So ivermectin significantly reduces the risk of dying from COVID-19. Looking at viral clearance, these are multi-day and single-day studies. You can see a marked improvement in viral clearance. If you look at time to clinical recovery, multiple versus single day, again, a marked increase in time to clinical recovery. Again, looking at mortality, these are randomized studies. These are observational studies, a highly significant reduction in mortality. There's no other drug which is available to treat SARS-CoV-2, which has such an impressive effect on viral clearance, improvement of symptoms, and mortality. And it's truly astonishing that the NIH cannot make a, a decision and can neither provide recommendation for or against a drug which is safe, cheap. So the cost to the WHO of a 12 milligram tablet of ivermectin is two cents, two cents compared to over $3,000 for remdesivir, which has minimal benefit. There are actually 56 trials in all. So within a few weeks or months, we should have a much larger database. In addition to its effect in patients with established disease, ivermectin has remarkable activity in preventing SARS-CoV-2. So this is prophylaxis in healthcare workers 788 randomized to ivermectin, 400 control, zero. That's zero patients who got ivermectin developed SARS-CoV-2. This is a look at all these studies, both observational and randomized controlled trials, again, demonstrating that ivermectin is a potent drug in both pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. In terms of its safety, this was a review of 25 years. Basically, they concluded that the drug has negligible adverse reactions in humans. The only problem is if you're a collie dog. So collie dogs have a problem with the blood-brain barrier and the glycoprotein um, export pump. They have a full-base deletion, which allows increase of ivermectin into the brain then acts on the GABA receptor. So that's the only problem. If you're a collie dog, you're in trouble. It has a robust safety profile. It can be used in children as young as six months of age. Most of the reactions are due to the death of the microfilaria rather than the drug itself. In patients with lower, lower, they rarely have an encephalopathy. It's not recommended in pregnancy or lactation. The only caution with ivermectin, it's a remarkably safe drug, is drug-drug interaction, most notably with calcineurin inhibitors. There is also a, a reaction with azole antifungal drugs. 
So this is a recent newspaper report. This, this young, well, not so young lady was dying in a hospital in Buffalo. The family requested ivermectin. The hospital refused. They got a judicial order and the hospital were forced by a court order to give the patient ivermectin. The patient who was on a ventilator in the ICU left the hospital a week later. This is not an uncommon scenario. We hear anecdote of anecdote of patients smuggling ivermectin into the hospital. They do this in Twinkies, in custard, in soup, you name it. They will go to extraordinary measures to save their loved ones. And the stories are truly remarkable. And it is most unfortunate that in our country, patients have to resort to such measures to smuggle effective safe drugs into the hospital, which doctors refuse to give. So just to kind of wrap this up, how do we control this pandemic and save lives? As we started off, we're facing a complete and utter cat catastrophe. We are facing a catastrophe and we really have to act now, if not sooner. Most importantly, we need to inform and educate the public, and I suppose physicians as well, need to understand this disease because knowledge is power. We therefore need public health measures, mass social distancing, no group gatherings and testing. Most important, prophylaxis in high-risk groups, vitamin D, melatonin, vitamin C, quercetin, and ivermectin. Most importantly, we need to change our emphasis on treating critically ill people in the ICU to early treatment at home with an effective program which will completely eradicate and treat this disease, the use of ivermectin and aspirin. In those patients who arrive at hospital, we need to treat them aggressively with meth plus, use methylprednisolone in those patients who require oxygen, and obviously vaccination is important so that these measures are not, do not compete with each other, they all complement each other. It's going to take months, if not years, to vaccinate the entire world population. So we're facing a catastrophe right now. Vaccination will not solve this problem. We need to institute other measures right now. There is also the problem of mutation. There are a number of mutant strains with this mutation in the spike protein. It seems that the variant found in South Africa appears to be resistant to neutralizing antibodies. So that may pose a problem, whereas other measures such as ivermectin will still remain effective. And with that, I thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes if some folks have some questions. So again, thank you for my invitation. Hopefully that was somewhat informative. Thank you so much, Dr. Merrick. Um, so we'll open it up to questions right now. Dr. Merrick, we, oh, this is Lucy Palmer. Um, we were using high dose solumedrol in the spring, not knowing if we knew what we were doing. We were using it in people who were in the ICU. And then we were using tosi, which never bore out. Now the recommendation from the hospital, of course, is Dex and remdesivir. Yes. And your lecture has, has opened my eyes. Um, and then you're talking about the ivermectin. And then the, since hospitals move so slowly in their policy making, I'm wondering if you're able to use it in your own hospital. Yeah, so you asked some good questions. You know, we're facing a pandemic and you're right, things move slowly. This is no time for slow movement. And, you know, what I find frustrating is because, you know, recovery using use dexamethasone, six milligrams, people considered, you know, carved in stone. You know, they automatons, they lemmings, they can't think. And, you know, anyone who practices pulmonary medicine will know that you have to titrate these drugs. So, you know, we titrate to response. Sometimes 
you know, when we do it, we do a CT scan when they come in. If they have a horrible looking CT scan, we will bolus them right up front with high dose metal thread. As the studies show, you've got to hit them early. If you wait until after 48 hours, 72 hours, you actually have missed the boat. So it's really early treatment. We think methylprednisolone for multiple reasons is the drug of choice. We think that vitamin C acts synergistically together with, a, with um, corticosteroids. TOSI seems if you dose them appropriately with steroids seem to have minimal, minimal benefits. And the question of ivermectin is just so frustrating um, you know, we managed to get the NIH to reverse their previous stance on recommending against. However, their recommendations, neither for nor against, are so inadequate, inopportune, ignorant, that we've actually written a letter to them saying they clearly do not understand what they're talking about. So we plead to them to please change what they're doing. It just makes no sense. This is a drug which has been used for 30 years, has a remarkable safety record, is on the WHO list of essential medications, has been shown in randomized controlled trials to reduce the risk of death. However, because these are not large mega trials done in the USA or the UK, they have the xenophobic attitude that somehow these physicians all across the world have conspired to make up this data. So, you know, viral clearance and mortality are hard endpoints. And it seems remarkable that all these clinicians across the globe would somehow conspire to make up this data. It's remarkable that we're facing this situation. You know, hopefully with the new Biden administration, things will start moving in the right direction. But I think the amount of misinformation is truly astonishing. And you know, physicians aren't prepared to think out of the box. They follow these ridiculous guidelines. Um, you know, the problem with the recovery study was that they used one dose. And people think that that's the way you treat them. And clearly that's not the case. And obviously you raise a really important question. And you know, that's why we're trying to get this information out there. You mentioned uh, xenophobia and I wonder if it's pharma's phobia of the, the three cent drug versus something more. Lucrative. Yes, so you know, that's, you know, I, I, yes. So that's, I mean, that's obviously what's underlying this and it's difficult to talk about it that the US could spend $3.7 billion stockpiling monoclonal antibodies that don't work. That, that we know all the scandals around remdesivir, which is still recommended by the NIH, $3,000 a dose. Yet you have a drug which you can buy for two cents and they won't, they will not recommend for it. So obviously, you know, people must make their own conclusion, but it's clear that there's a lot of mischief afoot and it's clear who's responsible for this mischief. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk, Dr. Marek. Uh, I'm just wondering um, about the uh, use of anticoagulation. We anticoagulated a lot of patients here in the spring, but now it's not highly recommended. Um, I've also heard mention that there's that the the uh, underlying pathophysiology might not be thromboses in the lung, but shunting uh, through uh, dilated blood vessels. I'm wondering if you can comment on the latest in yes. your um, armamentarium. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you raised two important questions. So there's no question you have profound VQ mismatching and shunting. That's why there's really interesting data on the combined use of almatrine and um, inhaled nitric oxide, because paradoxically, one gets blood redistribution to the areas of consolidation and on organizing pneumonia. So there's profound BQ mismatching, but you know, autopsy and other studies demonstrate microvascular thrombosis. About 30 to 40% of patients have overt uh, thromboembolic disease. So we, we've not seen bleeding and speaking to many of my colleagues, they have neither seen bleeding, but that's if you use, you treat the vasculitis. 
I think if you have an untreated vasculitis and then you give heparin, you may bleed. Now the active force study was terminated because of a so-called harm signal in the critically ill people. We haven't actually seen that data. So there's been a trend towards using intermediate dose anticoagulation together with aspirin. A paper recently came out two days ago showing intermediate dose plus aspirin uh, showing a mortality benefit. So obviously this is controversial. Uh, what we recommend is either guided by thromboelastography or D-dimer and much like the methylprednisolone, just using a fixed dose doesn't make a lot of sense. So, you know, patients have evidence of a very high D-dimer and ongoing coagulation and a profoundly abnormal PEG, then they probably require higher dose anticoagulation. If those parameters are closer to normal, then, you know, they could do with, you know, low dose or intermediate dose. So again, I think there's no one treatment that fits all. And treating patients, we know this. Patients are different. The idea you could treat every patient with the same treatment is completely absurd. It has to be individualized. So I think the question of anticoagulation is an ongoing issue. We don't have a lot of good data, but you're absolutely correct. Many of these patients have profound VQ mismatching. So, you know, there are many things you can do. Um, one of the intriguing treatments is giving low dose TPA. And many of these patients actually, their oxygenation improves with TPA, but this should be guided by thromboelastography. So I, I think one, one has to individualize treatment to these patients because no two patients are, are the same. Do you, have, do you have any comment to make on uh, use of uh, vasodilators like NO or epoprostenol by inhalation? Yes, yeah, so we do that and it seems to help because maybe it improves BQ mismatching. So we use, uh, you know, inhaled lowland because it's kind of cheap and it seems to improve. What seems to be good is you could combine that with cooperative proning or pro cooperative repositioning. There is some really interesting data combining that with almatrine, which is a pulmonary vasoconstrictor given IV. So I think it has a role. So I think, you know, there, there has to be a stepwise approach to these patients. You know, you're gonna give them nasal cannula, high flow. You're then gonna maybe try flow land. You're gonna try flow um, cooperative proning. You obviously wanna do whatever you can to avoid intubating these people. So I think it's a progressive, thoughtful approach. And then obviously, you know, you, you wanna keep their sets and their, the, you know, in the high 80s is fine. Trying to have normal blood gases is, 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 is not correct. So I, I do thank people who watch. So, you know, we, this is a lot of information. And you know, we, on our website, flcc.net, we have a whole host of resources, including our updated guidelines. And if anyone has any questions, they're more than, you know, more than happy for people to email me. Um, because I think, you know, we need to get the message out there. We can't just sit back and do what we told to do. That has failed, you know, doing what, fail, what has failed up until now is not going to change this awful trajectory. We have to change what we're doing. And I think the key is early treatment at home and aggressive treatment in hospital. Are there any final one or two questions for Dr. Merrick? Dr. Merrick, hi, it's Caesar from the pharmacy department. I just had a quick question on the ivermectin. When do you consider initiating it? And when do you think it's too late to initiate it? Oh, it's an interesting question, it's never too late. So Dr. Roger from Florida used it in ventilated patients who are getting steroids. And he actually showed a remarkable mortality reduction in ventilator patients from about 60% to 30%. So what's remarkable about this drug is it seems active against all phases of the disease because it has antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties. So presumably in the pulmonary phase, it acts synergistically with corticosteroids to dampen this inflammatory response. So in hospitalized patients, we recommend five days 
at a dose of 0.3 micrograms per kilogram, and it can be given down the NG or feeding tube. Dr. Merrick, thanks for um, coming and speaking with us. Um, I actually just had a question about uh, vitamin C. Um, you know, sometimes when we use IV uh, vitamin C, I feel like we're giving a lot of fluid. Um, is there a, a difference between using PO uh, and IV? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. It's very difficult to achieve. So we know from studies, almost 100% of patients with COVID-19 are profoundly vitamin C and vitamin D deficient. It's very difficult to restore normal levels with PO. So we recommend PO in the prophylaxis and early home treatment. Once they get to hospital, they need IV therapy. And it seems the sicker they are, the higher the dose they need. So that's where we kind of made an error in the beginning. We were recommending lowish doses. So, you know, we're recommending now doses similar to what Dr. Fowler used in the Citrus ALI, as well as in patients who are really sick, mega dose. And, you know, you can give, put 25 grams in, you know, 500 cc's and run it over, you know, 12, 6 to 12 hours. So, you know, the fluid is somewhat of a problem, but if you give it through a central line, it, it's less of an issue. Are there any remaining questions? Dr. Merrick, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Um, I'm Steve Cooperberg. I'm one of the attendings. Um, in terms of zinc levels, um, you know, there's been some literature about uh, hypozincemia and having low zinc levels leading to worse outcomes in sepsis and pneumonia. I, I, I see and agree with you know, zinc supplementation. Do you have any role for checking levels in some of these patients? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, the same thing is checking vitamin C or D. I think what one can assume the levels are low. I, I think that it, it makes sense to give zinc because of the effect on T cells and immune function. Zinc also is a, is a um, inhibits the RNA, depend RNA polymerase of the virus. And in fact, giving uh, a certain or acts as a zinc ionophore so I think it's remarkably safe when you short term, you know, whether it's going to take time for the zinc level to come back. So we just give these patients zinc. It seems a pretty benign intervention. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, Dr. Merrick, thank you so much for um, giving your talk today. We really appreciated it. It's uh, going to um, elicit a lot of discussion amongst our our group about ivermectin and um, initiation of it in our unit. So thank you very much. Sure, I mean, I think that's the whole point, you know, is, is to get people thinking, to think out of the box, to think of other ways to approach this awful pandemic, because I think we just have to follow a different route and, you know, hopefully people will talk about it. And that's kind of the goal of my talk. So, so thank you kindly. And hey, Abigail, if you could send me a copy of my talk, I would be most I will, grateful. I will. Thank you, Hank. Okay. All right. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Sure. Thanks, Hank.